Hello. I'm glad you decided to join this session. My name is Christoph Fea. I'm a market development engineer at Aero Electronics and welcome to this demonstration. I'm going to show you a new platform, the Datastorm Deck, which is a result of the collaboration between Aero Electronics, analog devices, manufactured and designed by Trends Electronic and supported by eInfoChips, an Aero company. Datastorm Deck is a carrier board based on an Intel Cyclone 5 SOC FPGA. An SOC FPGA integrates both processor and FPGA architectures into a single device. As a result, it provides higher integration, lower power, smaller board size, and as signals between the processor and the FPGA reside on the same silicon, communication between the two consume less power while offering higher bandwidth and lower latency. But let's come back to the Datastorm Deck board. It was created to provide a single platform that enables the evaluation of various analog devices, precision signal chain and RF transceiver products. As of today, the following analog devices products are supported as complete reference designs. Complete reference design means that we provide extensive documentation, including quick start guides, platform architectural descriptions, instructions on how to rebuild the design along with bootable SD card images. We also offer developer starter guides. These guide developers through the process of creating their own reference designs and can also act as a starting point for future customization. Today I'm going to focus on the setup with the ADRV9002, which is a dual channel, narrowband and wideband RF transceiver platform. It has two independent receive and transmit channels and two on-chip RF local oscillators that can be routed to any of the receivers and transmitters. It has a tuning range of 30 MHz to 6 GHz and scalable bandwidth from 12 kHz to 40 MHz per channel and comes with signal correction algorithms or tracking calibration algorithms. ADRV9002 comes with several advanced features including fast profile switching for dynamic data rates and sample rates flexible power versus performance control, monitor mode for system power and sleep mode optimization, multi-chip synchronization, and digital pre-distortion or DPD for narrowband and wideband waveforms. Digital pre-distortion is a technique used to improve linearity or compensate for non-linearity in power amplifiers. Power amplifiers are a critical part of every communication system and it is crucial to improve their efficiency and overall performance. Ideally, amplifiers should be perfectly linear, which means that the output signal should be the exact copy of the input signal. Unfortunately, it is not possible to make perfectly linear amplifiers and that's because amplifiers such as transistors are nonlinear by nature and this also introduce, introduces nonlinearity to their output. This leads to spectral regrowth, that can lead to interference, or it can also lead to violation of emission standards set by regulatory bodies. It can also lead to degradation of bit error rates and data throughput of the communication system. Digital pre-distortion is a cost-effective linearization technique which aims to provide improved linearity, better efficiency, and take full advantage of power amplifiers. Digital pre-distortion applies inverse distortion using a pre-distorter at the input signal of the power amplifier to cancel the distortion generated by the power amplifier. Coming back to the Datastorm deck board, it can either run remotely, being connected to a laptop through an Ethernet cable, or it can run in standalone mode, in which case you only require a display, an HDMI cable, a mouse and a keyboard. Everything in that case is run locally on the device. In this setup today and in this demonstration today, I'm going to use the standalone mode. And to better understand what's happening, let me explain the setup I have here and then also talk a bit about the software architecture. First, the setup. I'm using the ADRV9002 to generate signals which are fed back to its receive channels. An application called IIO Oscilloscope running on the Datastorm deck board gives me control over the ADRV9002 settings while also capturing and displaying the signal. As mentioned, this is the standalone mode, so I'm not using other PCs or laptops, only the Datastorm deck board. 
The ADRV9002 evaluation board is connected to the DataStorm deck board, along with a keyboard, a mouse, and a display. An SD card is also inserted, and this SD card contains the bootable image file. Before powering the board, you need to make sure that the DIP switches there are configured correctly. This is the, to avoid damage to the ADRV9002 evaluation board. All of these instructions can be found on our GitHub page, and now we are ready to power the board. But how does the IIO oscilloscope application communicate with the ADRV9002 chip? Let me explain why the system boots up. At the core of this architecture, there is a Linux kernel running on the Cyclone 5 SOC FPGA. This Linux kernel is using the Linux Industrial Input Output Subsystem, or IIO, to control the ADRV9002 chip. The main purpose of IIO is to provide support for devices that in some sense perform either analog to digital or digital to analog conversion, or both. The IIO core offers both a unified framework for writing device drivers for many different types of embedded devices and a standard interface to user space applications manipulating these devices. To make it easier and faster to develop applications that interact with IIO devices, Analog Devices has developed the LibIIO library. This library abstracts the low-level details of the hardware and provides a simple yet complete programming interface that can be used for advanced projects or applications. The Analog Devices IIO Oscilloscope is a graphical user interface application which demonstrates how LibIIO can interface different evaluation boards, in our case the ADRV9002 evaluation platform, from within a Linux system, in our case the DataStorm Deck board. So the IIO oscilloscope makes use of the APIs provided by LibIIO and it can display the captured data in different modes while also allowing the view and modify several settings of the ADRV9002. But that's enough talking. Let me show you the demo. After the system has booted, you can start the IIO oscilloscope application. As I mentioned, the IIO oscilloscope allows me to control several settings of the ADRV9002. You can make those changes in the settings view in this other window here. For this demonstration, I'm going to set the local oscillator for the receiver and the transmitter to 2400 MHz. And you can see that on the receive side, it's the default setting. I just need to change it on the transmit channel. And I will, I will also change the transmit attenuation to negative 24 decibels. Any change that you do in this view is automatically implemented on the chip. The IIO oscilloscope also includes a transmit waveform control option, which allows the user to select one of several waveforms to be transmitted. I will show you three modes today. First, the one continuous wave tone mode. Then I will send two CV tones. And finally, I will also show you a complex signal. So first, the one CV tone. These settings are already made. I just uh, need to change this to, let's say, 0.01 megahertz. And now I can go back to my scope view, make it full sized, and now you have different options. First, you can select the plot type. You have uh, the time domain and frequency domain views, which are probably the most useful. Uh, let's stay with the time domain for now. And then in, or in order to start the capture process, you also need to select the channels. And in our case, we need to select voltage 0i and 0q. And now I can press the start. Now, you can see that we have a signal here, but um, it's not 
it's not stable, it's running on the scope and uh, we can quickly fix that by changing the trigger settings. So stopping the capturing process, right click on the channel name and then trigger settings. Now I would like to select uh, the voltage zero I channel as the source of the trigger and just change the trigger level to any value but one will be just fine. Now if I press the start button again, you can see that it's a much stable, more stable signal. The other thing is the frequency domain view. And you can, you can do, make several changes here, but I will leave these as they are. Um, the only change I will, a change I will make is uh, I will change the average, because if I run it now, Although the peak signals are quite stable, but everything else is very static, very noisy, and uh, just uh, too much information is happening here. So if I make that, if I change the average from one to ten, I will see the average result of ten uh, incoming signals, and you can see that the signal is now mo much more relaxed. It's smoothing out, and. I can now add my markers and I really like the peak markers functionality and uh, it starts the markers from uh, counting them from zero so you can see that the first and the most relevant marker is at 0 0.01 megahertz which is the frequency we selected and then you can see some additional uh, values that there in this view now I will keep this running and I will show you what, ha what happens if I change the, uh, the transmit mode. So let me come back to this view, the settings view, and select the two CV tone option. Now you can see that the first tone hasn't changed, it's still that 0.01 megahertz signal. And now I have a second tone at 0.08 megahertz. The only thing I need to do is just to change the scale just a bit so back to negative 18 as as on the other stone and I, I also need to click elsewhere in order to load that value so this is implemented immediately on the chip and if I go back to the view now now you can see that P1 has also risen now and you can see it there at the bottom left that we again we still have the 0 0.01 megahertz tone and now we have the 0 0.08 megahertz tone also at almost exactly at the same level. Just for uh, fun, I can go back to the time domain view so to show you what this signal, how this signal looks. And I will now use the single shot capture. Okay, finally, Let's see what we can do, how, we, how a more complex signal looks. And you can transmit complex signals using this DAC buffer output option. And now you will have um, a selection of, um, of waveforms and signals that you can select from. And for this demonstration, I'm going to select this QAM16 file. And uh, before I press the load button, because if I press the load button now, I will get an error message saying that there is an invalid channel selection. So that tells me that I need to tell which DAC channels I would like to use. And for this, I will select voltage zero and one. And if I press the load button again, You can see that the message changed. It's uh, the waveform has been successfully loaded, and uh, I can go back to the scope view. Now the time time view time domain view will, will not tell you too much information. I think even if you just use the single shot, but selecting the frequency domain, uh, leaving everything unchanged you will see that it's a very different frequency um, shape, an FFT shape. Um, 
appropriate for the QAM16 signal. This is all nice, but what can you do with the Datastorm Deckboard? How you can use it to develop your application and what languages are supported? Well, libiio is already part of the Linux distribution available for the Datastorm Deckboard. The mainline library was created in C, which means you can use C or C++ to create your script. However, we also offer built-in bindings for Python, and you can also use libiio to connect to MATLAB. This basically means that you can use all these three languages, or MATLAB, not just to get data from the ADRV9002, but also to control the chip. If you are running the standalone mode, then you can use C, C++ or Python and create your scripts locally on the platform and run them locally on the platform. If you want to run the remote option, which means that you are connected to your laptop with an Ethernet cable, then you can develop your scripts on your laptop in these three languages, or you can also use MATLAB, which enables more advanced signal processing and algorithm development. And here we come to the end to the demonstration and I would like to open this up for questions.